2 Samuel chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is a very fam familiar portion of scripture as it is the place where David sinned with Bathsheba. And after David had this sin, he was in desperate need of God's forgiveness. Tonight we're going to look at how God forgives. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and Beach Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Let's open up in prayer. Father, I pray that as we look tonight at how you forgive, that we will dwell on the wonder of your forgiveness and your great mercy to us. I pray that you will speak through me and that I will be humble and not step in the way of your word but that your word will I'll be very clear to um, everybody here tonight. May you be glorified through this message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we see in 2 Samuel 11, verse 1, David was in the wrong place. The kings go out forth to war, all the kings go out, but David stayed at home. In verse 2, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David not only was in the wrong place, but he also had the wrong thoughts. When he looked at Bathsheba, his first response should have been like Joseph, to run away from the possibility of the sin. But instead he stayed and he looked. And those looks became thoughts, and we will see further on that these thoughts became actions. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. David's wrong thoughts led to wrong actions. And as we will see in verse 14, that David then had a wrong response. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. David, when he was confronted with his actions by the fact that Uriah the Hittite was just and didn't go in um, to his wife when all the rest of the king's men were out in battle, he realized he had two choices. One, he could admit his sin, or two, he could cover it by getting rid of Uriah. And he chose the wrong response and got rid of one of his mighty men, as Second Chron as First Chronicles 11 says, Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. But that didn't stop David. He still had a wrong response. And then as we look at 2 Samuel 11, 26. And when the wife of Uriah the, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David then goes on and marries Bathsheba for the wrong reason. He married her in order to cover up his sin, and he thought by doing this, he would be able to hide it from people. Um, but as we see in 2 Samuel 12, um, that Nathan comes and does confront him. David had been in the wrong place with the wrong thoughts, did the wrong actions, had the re wrong response to his sin, and then married Bathsheba for the wrong reasons. And Nathan comes before him in verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress the, for the wayfaring man. But that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, 
The man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. David was confronted by his sin, confronted of his sin by Nathan. And verses, the rest of 7 through 12, talk about the conviction that is being placed on him. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. And before the son. And we see that David was convicted of his sin because of verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David had the right response finally. He confessed his sin to God. But as Pastor likes to say a lot, a man can choose his sin, but he doesn't get to choose the consequences of that sin. And as we start in verse 14, we will see one of the consequences of that sin. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him, to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. David never planned on having the child die. And as we look at 2 Samuel 12, 10, we'll see another consequence of David's sin. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Never there is saying all the days of your life. The sword is going to continually be in your house. And we see that in Amnon's murder when he is murdered by Absalom in 2 Samuel 13, 28, as well as Absalom's death as a rebel in 2 Samuel 8, 14. But not only that, as we look um, at verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, Absalom's rebellion, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. This was fulfilled when Ahithophel, King David's counselor, who then turned and helped Absalom, said, What you need to do is to show that you're the boss, is make a tent on top of, the cat, on top of um, David's house and take the rest of the concubines that he left here. And all Israel knew what Absalom did to David's wives. And that was fulfillment of this consequence that David suffered. But even though all these horrible things happened to David, the wonderful thing is found in 2 Samuel 12, 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. David was cleansed of his sin. David got God's forgiveness for his sin that he absolutely needed because without that forgiveness, he had been living in torment, as we will see in Psalms 32. Psalms 32, um, verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. David saying, as I was holding my sin within, there was incredible torment and pain. Psalms 32 is believed to have been written right after Psalms 51, 
which most of us are very familiar, was David's big confession about his sin with Bathsheba. And Psalms 32 is written very shortly afterwards. And as we look at verse 5, we see the base of the forgiveness that he was given because of his actions. Um, David said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. David finally looked at God and said, Lord, I acknowledge my sin as you see it. It is sin, and I was wrong. He didn't lie about it to himself and make excuses, but he was finally honest and acknowledged the sin. And my iniquity have I not hid. He finally stopped hiding from God. He finally opened up and told God the truth about his sin, even though he knew that God knew his sin. As we read through the Psalms that David had written, he writes over and over again how God has searched him and known him. God knows every single part. But yet David was still hiding that sin from God. And finally, he says, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. David didn't walk up and say, okay, I sinned, I'm sorry. David wasn't prideful in his sin. He wasn't arrogant. He was a broken, humbled man. David realized the depth of his sin, and he called out to God for forgiveness. And as he says in Psalms 86, he knew that he was coming to a God who was ready to forgive. David, broken over his sin, repents and asks for God to restore the fellowship that he once had. And he knew that God would accept him because, he had, because of 86.5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. God doesn't stand there when somebody comes before him asking for forgiveness and say, no, it's too late. God's always standing there waiting to accept a repentant heart and to forgive the sin. And there is incredible blessings in God's forgiveness, as we see as how David opens up Psalms 32. In verse 1, he said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. God's forgiveness of David said, I am a happy man. I am a blessed man. God has forgiven my sin. I don't have to deal with the sorrow anymore. I don't have to deal with the guilt or the shame or the pain that I was causing myself because of my unrepentant heart. But instead, I now have happiness, joy, and peace where there once was none. And that's because of God's forgiveness. And as we look at Psalms 103, Psalms 103 sh talks about how forgiveness is one of the main basis for our praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. That was the first thing that David said in praise. God has forgiven all my iniquities. And the absolute beauty of God's forgiveness is beyond understanding. If we look back at Psalms 32, 5 again. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. God, knowing me as a sinner, knowing everybody on this earth as a sinner, chose still to forgive us, though we will fall again. And every time we ask for forgiveness, God will forgive us. Now, for everybody that is saved and accepted the Lord as their Savior, their sin isn't going to send them to hell because God saves us forever. But our sin does break our relationship between us and God, and we no longer have the close fellowship that we could have. This is what God, um, Jesus is talking about in the Lord's Prayer when he says, forgive us our sins. He's talking about the release of a sin that we have kept in our heart that is keeping us from fellowship with God. And tonight we're going to look at a lot of different passages um, about God's forgiveness. 
in Psalms 103, 12, back to Psalms 103, we see that God removes our sin. 103, verse 12, As the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. If you go all the way to the east and all the way to the west, which since we've never actually measured how far that is, we have no idea how far it is. That's how far God has removed our sin from us when we confess it with a repentant heart. And the east and the west never touch each other. It's totally separate. It's totally gone. So we look at Isaiah 1, 18. We see another beautiful picture of how God takes our sins when we repent of them. Isaiah chapter 1 and in verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And as an Israelite heard this, they would be astounded because Scarlet, no matter how much you washed it, no matter how hard you worked, no matter how many times you put it through water, no matter how many times you scrubbed it, scarlet, the dye, once it was in the clothing, was there for good. It was never going to come out, ever. But yet God has the ability to cleanse us so much that not even an ounce of that scarlet is left. It is 100% clean, pure as white as snow. And that is the forgiveness that can only be given by God. He cleanses fully. Isaiah 38 shows another picture of God's forgiveness of sin as we look at verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. The writer is saying, I was in the pit of corruption, and your great love pulled me out, and you did that by taking my sins and casting it behind my back, behind thy back. And it's amazing that God not only casts our sins behind his back, if you look at Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, when God casts our sins behind his back, He also doesn't think of them at all. Jeremiah 31, verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God casts our sins behind his back when we come repentantly to him. He doesn't remember them at all. They are totally gone. They're not just out of his sight. They are completely out of his memory. He chooses to not remember our sins. They are not at all part of his thoughts. And he is able to do that um, through an explanation that he gives in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 um, in verse 25, it says, I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for mine own sakes, and will not remember thy sins. And as an Israelite would read this, blotting out the transgressions, blotting out is when a debt is fully paid. When, you, when somebody came to pay a debt, and once it was 100% covered, it was blotted out. It wasn't remembered anymore because it was gone. And God blots out our debt of sin and gives us full pardon, as seen in Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33, in verse 8, says, And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. God the righteous judge looks down at our sin when we are repentant and when we are humble and we ask forgiveness. And he, the judge who is only able to, pardons that sin. Nobody else can pardon sins but God alone. And he, seeing our sin, still chooses to pardon 1 John 1, 9, 
a very familiar portion of Scripture um, in the New Testament for us. And a very wonderful promise says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. He promises to forgive our sins, and He will, because He is faithful, because He is just, and He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Every single aspect of our unrighteousness is cleansed. But how could God do this? This is answered in verse 7. But if walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. Our sins are removed. They are clean. They're cast behind His back. They're out of His mind. He doesn't remember them. He blots them out and He pardons them. But all of that is contingent upon our response to our sin. If we decide to look at our sin and to hold it in and say, I can't let anybody know about this. I can't even confess it to God. Then you're going to experience what David did and that you will not have peace and you will not have joy and you will have sorrow because God's hand will weigh upon you. But if you look at your sin and you're honest with it, if you say, Lord, this was sin, and you tell him, ask him for forgiveness in a humble spirit, he is willing to forgive you don't need to go through life bearing the weight of our, your sin because Christ already paid for the weight of your sin on Calvary. Every single sorrow and pain that sin causes was borne by Christ on Calvary. So if you are here tonight with sin in your heart that you have not yet repented of, I beg you to get it done, finished tonight. There is nothing more painful than walking through life with sin. I've had times in my life where I have walked through life saying, I can deal with it later. It will, I can deal with it later. I just need to get to this point, and then I can deal with that sin. And that was by far one of the most miserable points in my entire life. But as soon as I confessed, as soon as I was repentant of my sin, there was this joy and forgiveness that only God can give. So if you have sin tonight that you haven't confessed of, please get it right tonight because God is ready and willing to forgive. Father, we thank you for your wonderful promises of forgiveness. How that though we as sinful and wicked people deserving to go to hell have received forgiveness through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that as we walk through our lives, we will not hold our sin in, but instead we will confess it to you and we will walk in newness of life, striving to become more like you each day. Help us to love you more, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Pastor.
We sing that song, Grace That Is Greater Than All Our Sin. It's a great song, isn't it? But it's a great truth as well. And so if you have, as Brother Johnson said, if you have sin, I guarantee you, you haven't broadcast that from the rooftop. And chances are, if anybody knows, maybe only one or two at most. But the important thing is that God knows, and he's provided that forgiveness. He's provided that grace. And we're, we're blessed people to have.